We are thrilled today to have Dr. Ryan Lafers on today. He is a research scientist at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He is also the CEO at Red Sea Farms. And if you don't know about uh, Dr. Ryan's research and work now, uh, we're excited for you just to hear about it. He is passionate about uh, desert agriculture. He is passionate about sustainable agriculture along shorelines or using salt water for cooling and for also growing. And so he has amazing uh, background in aquaponics and hydroponics and controlled environment agriculture. And we're thrilled to introduce you to him today and just hear a little bit about what is happening in his world. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy. Hey, I came here to work on what I consider to be one of the most challenging problems facing the world now and that is food and its connection to water security. So the food and water nexus and trying to grow more food with less water. So I grew up on a farm in the United States in South Dakota. Uh, and so we, we, grow, we grow like field crops like corn, wheat, soybeans, and we depend on rain. And so rain uh, in South Dakota, it's dryland agriculture. So some years, it's, plenty of rain and some years there's not enough rain. So uh, we have that real emotional and financial connection to water for agriculture um, because some years we would have good crops and some years we would have bad crops. So uh, in that context, I decided to become an agricultural engineer and uh, specifically with an interest in water. Um, and then the reason I chose to come to Saudi Arabia to work on this is what better place in the world to work on the challenge of water for food than in a place where there really is no or very little fresh water available to grow food. Do you know the percentage of just like arable land in Saudi or? Uh, there's a very small corner in the Southwest around Jazan that is supported by rain-fed agriculture. The rest of the country is uh, all based on irrigation from groundwater. And, you know, we're talking 80, 90% of that is from fossil aquifers that don't recharge or don't, re don't recharge at a rate that's reasonable for sustainable agriculture. What are some things about just Red Sea Farms, the business you own? Um, yeah, sure. So I started... That. Yeah, right. So I started Red Sea Farms um, with my co-founder, Professor Mark Tester. Uh, and really our goal was to merge. I'm an agriculture engineer. He's a plant scientist. He's working in plant salinity tolerance. Um, I was working on using salt water uh, in the engineering systems, especially on the greenhouse side for agriculture and putting those together to make a, a, an agriculture system or systems that use primarily salt water as an input because it's an abundant resource. Um, very sustainable um, <laughs> resource. Uh, so that was the original goal. Beside, when we started Red Sea Farms, we've since branched into including things like photovoltaics for, for energy to supply into the system. Um, so KAUST has two research centers that I am affiliated with, Water Desalination and Reuse Center and the Center for Desert Agriculture. So you see already the connection between food and water there. But um, so in the water desalination center, I mean, it's sort of like what it sounds. How can we make more fresh water available from salt water? Or how can we use these salt water resources in a more effective way or manage the fresh water resources we have in a more effective way? And then the, on the side of the Center for Desert Agriculture, it's about how do we grow food in these conditions? Um, and so uh, two big initiatives around that are using salt water um, and then also controlled environment agriculture. Are there some, have you been involved in aquaponics some as well? When you talk about the saltwater side, is that more hydroponic farming or is there a, a aquaponic side to that? No, there's a very big aquaponic side to that. So in a, in a covered agriculture system, like a greenhouse in a local environment, about depending on your exact location, 80 to 90% of your water use in that system is actually for cooling. And so we can substitute that entirely with salt water. 
Um, and then in the hydroponics or the aquaponics, you can then tailor the irrigation water for whatever you're growing. So like tomatoes, for example, which we grow a lot of tomatoes are actually relatively salt tolerant. And so we can use brackish water directly in that system. Um, and yeah, and, and just use it in the, the hydroponics or the aquaponics system. Very excited about, uh, let's say, future proofing our food system. And so making more food available in a more sustainable way. Uh, and also making better food available because it's local and it's fresh, uh, high nutrient density, uh, reducing air miles, things like that. So, um, yeah, in the end, it's about how can we how can we serve people and and meet their needs in a way that also serves the planet. Yeah, and of course. I mean, we're all living COVID nineteen pandemic, but <laughs> I mean, all these things were in your mind, in your practice, in your research, um, you know, before pandemic. But how has, uh, yeah just pandemic either accelerated things or has caused pivots in your research and work? Yeah, so I mean, I think COVID, of course, it's had some benefits and some um, drawbacks in terms of the work, not talking about the sickness itself. Um, but certainly people, I think, are more aware now of just health in general. Um, with the global pandemic and also with the disruptions in um, global supply chains, like the, the need or the, the awareness of local food security is much higher now, I think. Um, and then <laughs> in addition to that, we face challenges like everyone else around the world around traveling um, and doing business with, with COVID. Um, so there's, I think overall for, for, for us as a business and for anyone who's trying to do sustainable local agriculture, uh, COVID has helped to sort of um, increase our profile uh, in terms of what we're doing and its, its value to, to food security and to just you know, human life in general. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, what do you feel like kind of the future of aquaponics in the Middle East specifically? Um, well, I think there's a big potential, uh, you know, of course with aquaponics, you're getting the benefits of two products from the same water footprint because you're getting the fish and the vegetables. Um, and certainly, um, you know, diets are changing. People are becoming more aware of, uh, uh, you know, the sustainability of the food that they eat. Fish already was a, um, you know, in terms of water footprint, was a relatively low water footprint. And when you combine that into a system like aquaponics, where you're also getting the fresh vegetables out and you're getting a high quality product, um, you know, I think there's big potential. How do you see new just technology affecting um, either controlled environment agriculture or aquaponics? Um, just the idea of like 3D printing or uh, water testing or um, kind of different research developments. Yeah, right. Well, uh, we're talking about systems that are a, a, a step up in terms of technology from traditional open field farming anyway. So as we add more technology, uh, it just increases our control, which should in turn increase our productivity, increase our quality, um, and, and also reduce risk. Uh, so that we, we have less risk of losing a crop or less risk of, um, you know, quality impacts. So, yeah, technology definitely is going to improve these systems. Are there some cool developments happening with KAUST and just specifically that students are involved in? Or just oh, yeah. even in the sector in general, yeah. but what are some cool things that just students are uh, doing? Uh, students are doing a lot of, uh, well, really interesting research here. So, you know, from things like, um, you know, grafting of, of, of crops to make them more salt tolerant, you know, to research into just sort of the genetic background and what, what genes cause plants to be heat tolerant or salt tolerant, you know, to just new um, ways of desalination. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting research going on here. In, in the uh, same idea of research, what are some of your just 
favorite accomplishments that you've had in your research? Yeah, right. Well, that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot that I've enjoyed. I mean, I just enjoy learning in general. Um, so having the opportunity to learn and to, to, to look at and question and contribute to, to problems is something that I'm very excited about. Um, and then in terms of like specific like research that I've done, um, I've done a lot of work with liquid desiccants, which you know are used for humidity control in, in greenhouses in controlled environments, which is really important, especially in coastal areas, uh, hot coastal areas, such as the one that I happen to live in. Um, yeah, so I'm really, I guess, proud of that work. A desiccant is like most people are familiar with these little bag of silica beads that you find in like a, a new pair of shoes or like a, you know, electronics that you might buy. So that's a desiccant. It controls the humidity to keep, well, to preserve your whatever you're purchasing. Um, so what we're doing, we're using a liquid form of that. Um, so these these liquids are about usually about like 30% salt by weight. So think like the Dead Sea, for example, is like a giant, giant liquid desiccant. Um, but if you take that and you put it in a humid environment, it actually absorbs humidity um, because the, the salt that's part of that mix um, is hy hygroscopic. So it just means that it draws humidity. It has a, a lower vapor pressure than the air. Um, so we use those to control humidity. And the, the advantage of a liquid is that you can pump it around versus like a solid, you would have to carry it around or, you know, do something like that. So it provides operational flexibility using a liquid. What needs to happen for the expansion of aquaponics globally? Or the, the, <laughs> what needs to happen for the adoption of aquaponics globally? All right. Well, I think... You know, so in terms of expansion, it's about market demand. And I think we're seeing that the market demand is there and it's growing and, and COVID has sort of assisted with that. Uh, in terms of the adoption, that's about training and education. And so training and education and also um, creative financing <laughs> to enable these systems to take off. And, and they're really, you know, it's all part of the same package, but if people don't know how to operate um, and they don't have, uh, you know, sort of the base training and education, um, you know, these systems won't be operated effectively. And if the, the finance isn't there to get the systems off the ground, they won't get off the ground. So those are sort of the key things, I think, from just seeding an industry that are necessary. Yeah. Um, how would someone find out more about your work? Uh, well, there's a couple ways. So um, people can check out just sort of the, the KAUS website. KAUS is the acronym for King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. So you can find things there. There's a library website there where all of my scientific work is published and stored. So you can just Google my name and that'll come up. Um, in terms of like on the commercial side, Red Sea Farms, you know, we have a website, check that out. And you know, there's an info at Red Sea Farms email. Um, people can reach out and, you know, happy to support. Yeah. 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 Yeah.